Thank you for having me. The title of my talk is From Story to Consequence. And I have to confess that when I sent it in, it wasn't from story to consequence. But when it came back to me, that's what was there. And I was really inspired by it. And so I want to tell you three stories. Uh, one about a group of kids who took story to consequence. One very personal of my own about how I helped uh, use story to create a consequence. And one, how we're helping people now around the world tell stories that result in consequence. Um, and really the question for me is, how do we tell ourselves stories and tell the world stories that have consequences, both intentional and unintentional? So the first one was, I had the good privilege of teaching with a professor at Harvard University named Dr. Robert Coles. And Dr. Coles had a very simple premise that stories were the greatest teacher the world had to offer. So here at Harvard University, he had a course where all you did was read books, take them to heart, and talk about what they made you think about the world at large, the broader social issues. So in 2001, I started a program called Open Roads, and our intention was to do that for inner city high school kids who came from low-income backgrounds and who didn't have much to do in the summer. So the program was a month-long program. We recruited kids, um, sometimes they're called at-risk. I've never been a fan of that term, so we used to call them at-potential kids. But they come from Boston, Philly, New York, Chicago, LA, Bay Area, and we'd fly them to a region of the country, usually the Pacific Northwest. And for that month, they would travel in vans, they would shop for and prepare their own food, they would live in tents, they would go sea kayaking, rafting, hiking. But more than that, they were immersed in the documentary arts. So they had cameras, journals, pens, video cameras, and they create documentary accounts of what they were seeing. And what that meant was that whether we were in a gas station, in a grocery store, sometimes in the bathroom, at a campground, showering in the morning, they were talking to the people that they were meeting. And because we were in tourist places, these people were from all over the world. And I would like to tell you that this was part of my intention going into it, but as often happens with educators, we end up learning more from our students than they learn from us, or maybe it's equal. But the exchange in this one was, as we started talking about all the different stories they were hearing about from people around the world, they started recognizing how many different ways there were to live a life and that each of these people had created their own story. They've been authors of their own story. And I remember the first time a kid said that to me and said, we have a chance to be authors of our own stories. Now, that in and of itself is not the most profound thought, except when you then make the next step. And think about a kid and the imagination of a kid when they sit down in front of a blank piece of paper and start to write a story, and their imagination comes to life. Now all of a sudden, the confines of where did you grow up how much money do you have? It's not blocking what you think your potential is. So for these kids, there were many consequences, but one of the stories they decided to tell about themselves is they were all going to work together, stick together, stay together, uh, graduate high school, and go on to college. So of the 200 some odd kids that we had over those 10 years, uh, over 95% did graduate high school, did go on to college, and I know that's not always the measure of success, but it was one of the stories they wanted to tell about themselves that I was very proud of them for doing. Um, for me, that story led to another one. About a month after we ran our last Open Roads program, I was a confirmed bachelor, 38 years old, very happy to be so. The only kids I'd ever had were these kids. And then I met this woman. Now, if you've ever been on an airplane in the last 10 years, you probably have seen this face. Uh, PJ Osgood was one of the owners of It's Just Lunch and always had a full page uh, picture of herself as one of the country's top matchmakers. And when I met her, I was in awe. This woman had the ability to manifest whatever she wanted in her life. She was strong, she was courageous, and she was one of those people who, if you were sick, she didn't say, I hope you get better. She'd be there at your bedside. She didn't ask, what can I do? She just did it. You needed money, she helped you find it. If you were a kid who didn't have a parent, she literally helped kids match with parents. She was matchmaking even then. So once I spent the first month or so convincing her to stop matching me with all of her clients, and match me with her, the two of us fell in love. And one of her biggest qualities, I, I would say her identity, was that of courage. And it was all the things I just described. But if you went into her house, there were lions everywhere. There were lions guarding the door. There were lions guarding the books. There were lions guarding the soap. It was just her, her animal totem. And about two months into our dating, uh, we were very much in love. And she was told that she had uh, osteosarcoma. So, the, first time I've told the story in public. Um, 
And for those of you who don't know the cancer world well, that's not a cancer where the doctors want to say a lot of good news to you. They don't want to create false hope. But we decided we were going to make her journey with cancer a different story. And from the very beginning, it was going to be about courage. So we were at MD Anderson, one of our first meetings with a doctor, and in comes the head of the head of the head of the, one of the most prestigious cancer hospitals in the world in his starch white coat and his big bravado. Before he can get a word out, she looks at him and goes, OK, doc, doc, here are the rules. I don't want to hear about percentages. I don't want to know about stages. I'm not even sure I want to know what it's called. All I want you to tell me is what are we going to do to get through this? What are my options? And how are we going to get to the other side? And from then on, we changed the language for ourselves. It wasn't her treatment, it was her healing. It wasn't drugs, it was the medicine, it was the vitamins. Um, when we walked into the chemo rooms, we redecorated the entire room so it looked like we were on vacation. So these were our spa days. We would go there and she would get her medicine and I would meditate and do whatever I would do to kill the time. But we changed the story. One of the consequences of that for me was that I had the courage to stay with her during all this. I was a born and raised squeamish person around blood, but I became very comfortable with needles and, and fed off her courage. Um, one of the other unexpected consequences was one of the last days of her, of, before she passed, um, most of us around her started to understand that she was close. She didn't. And one of the other rules we had was we were never allowed to talk about what happens if, when you pass on. It was never part of our conversation. Throughout her time, she, night, she'd say, tell me a story about the future. What are we going to do later? So on the last night she was with us, um, I was sitting by her bedside, and she um, shot up in bed and looked at me and realized I was very emotional. She looked at me and she said, knock it off. This isn't that big a deal. I'm going to get through this. And I looked at her, uh, 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 yeah, yes, of course. And, and I, I always kind of believed that she might. So even the next day, and I don't know if anybody has ever experienced it, but I didn't realize this is actually how it happens, but we're standing by her bed as we're watching the countdown of the heart monitor going from 100 to 99 to 98 to 97, all the way down. And the whole time, I'm just waiting for her to bolt up and go, what are you guys doing? Knock it off. This is going to be all right. But it was her time. But what I realized was, because of the story we had chose to tell ourselves, and because we stuck with it right to the end, one of the consequences for PJ was that she got to hold on to this persona and be courageous to her family for her entire life. There were other unintended consequences. We never got to say goodbye. I never got to hear her tell me how she wanted me to honor her legacy in the future, and hopefully I'm doing that in a small way today. Um, but for me, it was just another one of those powerful, very personal ways in which story can generate consequence, both intended and unintended, in a beautiful way. After she passed, about a month later, I decided to commit my life to an organization called the Creative Visions Foundation. Creative Visions Foundation also comes from a complex story. There was an artist, adventurer, activist, and photojournalist named Dan Eldon, one of his good friends, uh, Rocco Bellic, who's going to be speaking here later today. Dan Eldon was one of the first people to get images out of Somalia in the early 90s that brought the aid into Somalia. One of the that would be the intended consequence. One of the unintended consequences was that the United Nations accidentally, um, on false information, bombed a civilian house that they thought was a safe house for General Adi. There was a riot that resulted and four journalists were killed that day and Dan Eldon was one of them. Um, on the heels of that, so you can imagine now, here's the person that helped get the story out, that brought the aid, that caused the confusion that somehow led to his death, or potentially. Off of that story, there are so many incredible consequences. Dan's mother, Kathy Eldon, and his sister, Amy Eldon Turtletaub, decided that his life was not going to be in vain. So they started Creative Visions Foundation to support other people who are using media and the arts for social change. We have films like Give Up Tomorrow that became the documentary evidence that overturned the death penalty in the Philippines. We have films like uh, A Small Act, that led to the creation of a scholarship for kids in Kenya who couldn't go to, afford to go into college. This provided hundreds and hundreds of scholarships. Um, Tom Blake Mikowski of Tom's Shoes said he was inspired by Dan to start Tom's Shoes. Um, Jason Russell of Invisible Children said he was inspired by Dan to start Invisible Children. It goes on and on and on. Um, Happy, the film that you'll hear from the director of Rocco Bellich later today, um, has changed the way all of us look at happiness. So there are these major stories that are coming out of and are the consequence, both intended and unintended, 
of someone telling a story. So my point in all this is that whether you're a big time filmmaker telling a documentary story about a major issue in the world, igniting major action, whether you're a small group of high school kids or your own friends and family telling the stories to yourself and to the world, or whether you're just a person, like PJ and I were, trying to make sense of the world, going about your every day, tell inspired stories. Think about the story you're telling about your own life, the decisions you're making in your own life. And for all of us, please remember that inspired stories ignite action. Thank you for letting me tell mine tonight.